The bombastic overture to this technology concert, which culminates in human communication, always sounds the same. First of all, a radio technician conducts a multitude of auxiliary machines so that the transmitter, the heart of the station, can play first fiddle, so to speak. To do so, it needs waves, which, expressed simply, can carry messages in the form of more signals, language or music. The location of this wave-generating technology concert is Grimmiton radio station on the southwest coast of Sweden. It once played a key role in global communication. Together with 20 other installations of this kind, from the 1920s on, it formed a worldwide radio network. Today, Grimmiton is the only fully functional long-wave radio station in the world. That's why it has been placed under the protection of UNESCO. And this is the venerable centerpiece of the station, the alternator transmitter. Its superb working order is still praised even today. Still running here, is a motor which drives an AC generator to produce high-frequency current. This power station of long-wave broadcasting was designed in 1904 by a man who is regarded as one of the pioneers of radio technology, Ernst Frederick Werner Alexanderson, engineer and tireless inventor. By the end of his life, he had registered a staggering 340 patents one of the most outstanding of which is undoubtedly the Alexanderson transmitter named after him. It made neutral Sweden an important international communication centre, especially after the First and during the Second World War. Because the transatlantic cable frequently snapped, Without wireless links, global communication would have been impossible. Despite the existence of invisible communication bridges, teams of engineers fought their way through the Atlantic with cable drums weighing many tons, trying to create underwater bridges for the ever-increasing communications activity between Europe and North America. Laying thick cables hundreds of thousands of kilometers in length between the old and the new world was like engaging in a mammoth battle with a giant serpent. It was a struggle the men often lost, because the cables were slippery and often slid down into the depths, never to be seen again, and costing investors millions. The discovery of electromagnetic waves and their seemingly magical propagation in space ushered in a dazzling new era of communications technology. Within a century, these waves changed the world as dramatically as the invention of the steam engine once had. Numerous pioneers of electrodynamics triggered off this revolution. It's to Count Alessandro Volta that we owe the fundamental theory of electric current. To Christian Ørsted, the discovery that electricity is accompanied by a magnetic field. To Michael Faraday, the development of the electro generator for producing current. To Samuel Morse, the code named after him, immortalized in the first Morse transmission, What Hath God Wrought? We owe to James Maxwell and Heinrich Hertz the epochal discovery that electrical oscillations create magnetic fields, which, when accelerated rapidly, become waves which can bridge time and space in an instant. 
It's to Giulielmo Marconi that we owe transatlantic transmission of the first radio signal. And finally, to Ernst Alexanderson, we owe the design of a machine that gave long waves the huge impulse needed to send them round the world in a flash. In addition to the experience gathered with susceptible underground and ocean cables in the First World War, construction of the long wave transmission station at Grimmerton was prompted by a gigantic wave of emigration to the New World. Thousands of Swedes sought their fortune in the land of allegedly boundless opportunity. Since this often meant saying goodbye forever, for most emigrants to the New World, wireless communication with their loved ones back home was an important mainstay in their new lives overseas. To enable the growing volume of telegram traffic to America to take place smoothly, in 1920, the Swedish government decided to build a transmitting and receiving station. The location in Grimmerton, some 80 kilometers from Gothenburg, was ideal. The flat terrain meant that the radio waves faced no obstruction to the west. They crossed the Skagerrak Sea, passed Scotland, and flashed across the ocean to the receiving station near New York and the name Grimmerton proved extremely practical because the Americans could pronounce it easily. Then, for two years from 1922, a hair-raising balancing act 127 meters above the ground and back-breaking work on it were everyday reality for the men involved in building the station. The biggest challenge was the construction of six antenna pylons, located at a distance of 380 meters from one another. With their enormous cross arms, the pylons looked like meticulously aligned launching pads for spacecraft. Even though today they merely serve as giant indicators as to Grimmerton's location, their unique and aesthetic technical stature reminds us of the days when this directional antenna system was one of the most important launch and control ramps for long waves. Staff at the station not only radioed, they also drove. And fairly often too, because the directional antenna system had to be inspected at regular intervals. A bicycle or a moped would probably have sufficed. But since construction of the station had cost half a million crowns less than expected, it was decided to invest in the luxury of this shiny automobile, although the driver probably only managed to impress cows with it. This vehicle, however, was cheered by thousands, because the distinguished figure it transported was none other than the monarch himself. On July the 2nd, 1925, His Majesty King Gustav V visited Grimmerton to officially inaugurate the Swedish radio station for wireless telegraphy to America. In doing so, he bathed in the glory of radio pioneer Ernst Alexanderson, who modestly remained in the background even though it was he who should have been fated on this occasion. 
After all, it was Alexanderson's generator and not the king that had made wireless communication with America possible. The fact that the radio station was inaugurated by the king himself underlines how important this new communication system was to Sweden. Over the next few decades, it was to conquer the airwaves. Messages were collected here at the central telegraph office in Gothenburg. Telegrams arrived one after another, were sorted and given a timestamp. Then the miraculous transformation of language into Morse characters began. These were then sent by a tape transmitter at the telegraph office via cable to Grimmerton. From there they were dispatched at high speed to America by means of long waves. Here on Long Island, the Morse signals were received and immediately converted back into language. To ensure that the telegrams, which had been handed in in Sweden only a short time before, could reach their recipients as fast as possible, smartly dressed telegram boys were at the ready all day long. Not only was radio telegraphy a milestone in the history of communication, it also helped to save lives, like when the Titanic sank. But soon the long wave transmitters were also used to transport nonsense, which at times filled the columns of the newspapers published on transatlantic steamers. While sailing to America, German novelist Thomas Mann was constantly irritated by repeated news of a drunken tiger in a zoo. In Voyage with Don Quixote, he wrote, a technological wonder like radio telegraphy has to serve to transport such news over land and sea. How sad that mankind's intellectual and moral progress has failed to keep step with his technological advances. Indeed, it has remained well adrift of it. If mankind's intellectual and moral progress lagged behind his technological advances, even in the days of wireless telegraphy, it is perhaps prudent not to ask about the modern day state of mind and morals in wireless communication. It's perhaps better that we do not know how many stories flashed around the world every single day are no better than the tale of the drunken tiger.